Okay, welcome back. So we looked at teamwork. Um, we're going to quickly look at two more chapters. I hope I can complete the two. If not, I'll defer one chapter for later. Another couple of um, elements of what are the elements that we've already done? Communication. Then? What? Conflicts and becoming a team. These are three things that we did. Okay, we have a few more. We're going to look at home management and sex and sexuality. We'll try and see if we can finish both. If not, we'll keep one for next week. Okay, managing a home. I'm on chapter seven. We're going to be doing managing your home, chapter seven. Uh, they're fairly simple, so I'd hope to just run through some of this. Okay, so when you manage your home, you need to be very practical about it more than being spiritual. No? Correct? Right? You can't call upon the angels to do all your work. You have to get down and do some of the work that is needed. But you do that with wisdom. You do that with understanding. What does Proverbs 24.3 says? Homes are built on the foundation of wisdom and understanding. You should be wise to be able to manage your home. Okay, so these may be some things that you already know, but it's it's important to um, keep a, a note of this. Okay, so let's quickly look at some of this. So one of the things you need to determine when you're managing your home is to decide that uh, how you are going to, where you are going to make your home. Usually after marriage, at least in the Indian culture, the tendency is to Yeah, stay in the husband's home. I think so, right? Maybe in, uh, maybe most of our cultures it's like that. I think a lot of us are from down south. I don't know. Anyone from North India? It's the same there for you? Uh, east, it's different. I know the East is a, uh, it's a more matriarchal family. So people actually go to the mother's house, right? Okay, so it's important to make a Decision as to where you're going to make your home. So what is recommended is to be able to stay independently. right? Sometimes maybe your finances and your stage of life may not permit it because probably you don't have enough finances to... What's happening? There's, a, there's another uh, managing home happening over there. Okay. All right, so it's important. Uh, sorry, what was I saying? Uh, staying independently. Uh, sometimes it may not happen because of the financial situation of the couple. And maybe briefly, till you are able to set up things on your own, um, you know, you stay with your parents. Now, I also understand that in some homes, it's not culturally possible. You are expected to stay with your parents, uh, you know, and we respect that. But it's important to um, that the couple focus on their marriage and not permit interference, uh, you know, with parents and extended families uh, in your in your marriage. So it's so it's good to know um, how where you are going to make your home, and that's one thing you need to talk about. Yeah, that's what I said. I I mentioned that maybe in some cultures, that's not possible. You are expected to stay together. And that's where you need to make your uh, decision of how you will uh, spend time focusing on your own relationship and building together your decision and all of that. So that's very, very important. And there should be a balance on that. Okay, so getting to understand that is very important, but it's always nice. Why is it nice that a husband and wife independently start living separately? Okay, other than that, you learn to live life. No? Asapu, you learn to live life, right? Because you will make your own decisions. You will, 
you, are, you, are, you will know what your responsibilities are. You all will have to support and help each other. Okay, I think there's a question. Uh, know each other, know the responsibilities. Yes, yes, right, Lucy. That's exactly. So it, in a way, it's, it's actually very good that a couple stays uh, uh, independently rather than staying with their families. Okay, let's look at the next one. Schedules. Um, that is daily and weekly schedules. Now, once you get married, life will keep going. It's not nothing's going to wait for you. But you have to be intentional on how you spend your time and you schedule your activities for the day or for the week. Uh, if if we don't pay attention to it, a week will go by when you don't spend enough time with each other, or a week will go by when you're not spending extended time with each other. So there needs to be a balance of work and a family, or ministry and a family. So to keep that uh, understanding and how do you schedule that in. Okay, so knowing how it is important to um, spend sufficient time with each other and so plan your schedules, your daily schedules and your weekly schedules accordingly. Okay, the next is yeah, certain responsibilities in the house. Yes. <laughs> All right. Who takes these responsibilities together? Yeah. Maybe you don't have to uh, pay bills every day, but there are some things you have to do every day, like cooking and cleaning has to be done every day. Laundry maybe once in two days, or grocery shopping maybe once in a week or twice in a week. But it's all something that has to be done and the tasks that need to be shared. Right? So actually discussing that and talking about who's going to do what and uh, who is better at what or what are you going to outsource. Maybe both of you don't know how to cook, so you can't starve. So you need to get additional help or whatever. Right? So understanding how that's going to take place. The next is how you use. Yes, your technology. Very often your mobile phone is your spouse, no? You spend a lot of time looking at it, cleaning it, washing it. Sorry? Asafu's phone? iPhone, <laughs> OK. Yeah, so how you are going to use your technology, really uh, use technology matters. To be able to uh, have some rules. Do you all have some rules in the hostel? You'll do. What are they? <laughs> <laughs> really? You can't go out after 6 30? Huh? Ah, I'm talking about mobile. You have to submit mobile at 9 o'clock. And when do you get it back? Nice practice for all the boys. Very nice. You're the in charge, Asapu. So you collect all the phones, huh? So you keep the phones, Asapu. Huh? <laughs> okay. So that's see, so that's a practice here, right? So similarly, even in the home. There should be a practice of um, not just phones, but all kinds of media, television, Netflix, all of that, right? Where you uh, know that all of that is kept, unless, of course, there's an emergency or things like that, OK? The next is family recreation and vacations. Is it important to have a recreation and vacation? So what do family vacations do? It makes you create memories, no? Some nice memories. I'm sure you remember memories of how you went for a trip or picnic or something like that in your childhood, isn't it? So just because it really helps to bond together, to relax, to have fun, to play games, to laugh, to enjoy life. Maybe you're doing some things together. That becomes something that you need to plan. The next one is to 
budgeting and planning financially. Um, why is it necessary to budget? To save. Okay. Yes. If you don't budget, how many of you budget? Is it? That's a very important skill to budget. I'm sure you're right every month, right? How do you spend it? Huh? What Diksha? Yeah, that's a budget, right? So if you know you get, let's say, 2,000 or 3,000 rupees, you say, OK, I need uh, whatever 1,000 rupees to pay the hostel. Then I need 500 rupees for my phone, 500 rupees to eat outside. I have 1,000 rupees with me. OK, and I'm just giving you very broad things. But if you don't plan, You're going to spend it, and finally you won't have any, anything. And what will you be doing? Borrowing. No, Asapu? Ask from parents only. OK. So budgeting is very important. So you also know how to live in your means. If there is 3,000 rupees given to you, you live in those means, right? And even when you're budgeting, it's important to do two other things. Three other things. Number one is to tithe, to give to God 10% of your, a minimum of 10% of your income. Okay. And the other two things it's to save and to invest. Saving is to keep aside, investing is to putting your money into something so that it will grow. Yeah. Are these new concepts? Everyone's looking very blankly at me. Familiar but ignoring. OK, so if I were to give you a breakup, you know, this is what's actually helped us to do it, is divided. Uh, now, this can be arbitrary. I mean, it can, it can move from here and there. But generally, 50% of what you have goes for your expenditure, for your home, for things around. 15 to 20% both in saving and investing. So 15% you save, 15% you invest. And again, 15, um, 10 to 15 or 20% you tithe. So when you keep a percentage like that and build a budget, it helps you to manage your money. OK? Uh, there is no, no time to begin. And no, there is no wrong time to start saving. You can even save now. How many of you save? Nobody? Everyone is hiding from me. <laughs> OK. You save? OK. So even with the money that you get right now, even if it is a few hundred rupees, or even if it's a minimum of 500, Keep it aside. Okay, put it into an account or put it into something that will eventually grow. So that's a principle my father taught me right from the time I started. Now I didn't uh, for two years when I was I was studying and I was getting uh, some little, very little, but that's something he taught me, and I haven't forgotten that until now, and I keep doing that, and it and I was very proud that I that I was able to do a lot for my own marriage because I saved for maybe 10 years before that. right? So you take that responsibility. Go ahead and do it. Because when you budget and you do it, then the, the temptation to just spend on useless things will go. OK? So that's, that's, about, that's about budgeting. OK? And also planning on financial goals is something that you need to do. And I think there are a lot of things you can save and invest in, which is also uh, spoken about here. OK, other things is 
uh, things with your parents and in-laws. Okay, so we've emphasized this many times before of being able to um, uh, independently build your marriage together while you also honor and honor your parents. So yes, it's important to maintain good relationships with them, and but at the same time, uh, ensure that you have your own independence. Also, to support your parents financially, like when the, when the time comes, uh, in whatever way that is possible for you. Uh, and you do that with, under, with, with both of you agreeing. So it's done with mutual understanding, OK? Also, to be able to care for those who may be sick or widowed or in absolute need in your home. OK? So that's about managing the home. Any questions here? Any questions from the online students? OK. We'll go to the eighth chapter, which is sex and sexuality. Again, a very uh, uh, a go, uh, an important element in marriage is to be able to build sexual intimacy and enjoy a healthy sexual life. OK? So what we're going to do here is uh, understand um, who designed sex, why did God design sex, and also probably some uh, important factors of that. All right? Um, so let's first of all look at who made sex, who designed sex. Are we sure? How? When? <laughs> yeah. So the very fact that God bought Adam and Eve together and gave it to them as a way to enjoy their relationship is how, how we do understand that God is the one who designed sex. So there is, sex is considered, sex or sexuality is considered to be holy. It's considered to be that which we should see with reverence and honor. But why has it become such a difficult thing to talk about now? Right. So it's, it's, if you look at it, every one of God's good gifts is distorted. Everything God has given is something good, like marriage is, is a good thing, right? Or sexuality is a good thing, or the ability to make wealth is a good thing. But what's happened because of the fall? Everything is, uh, yeah, it's distorted. It's used for pleasure, it's used for sin, it's used in a wrong way. And that makes it difficult to even actually talk about it. But when you look at the original design of it, God made it holy. He made it for a purpose, that is, for between a man and a wife, man and a woman, a husband and a wife, within marriage, and for specific purposes. All right? So um, it, it is important for us to understand the basis of that, what, how God why God designed it and God designed it for our, because he wants to give us good gifts. He wants us to have pleasure and enjoyment, and that's why he gave us those good gifts. Okay, So I think before we look into this chapter, it's important for us to, first of all, understand what do we think about sex and sexuality. Maybe some, the way that we grew up and we understood about sex and sexuality was all from different... Um, Yes, from our, our, the contributions of our knowledge came from maybe the internet or from friends or from movies, which has shown a very, very broken picture of what sex is. Right? And so that's why we find it even hard to probably talk to a spouse about it. But the way God designed it was to honor it. As it says in Hebrews 13, for honor marriage, guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy. So anything that is casual or outside of marriage 
is considered to be unholy or illicit, not in the plan of God. Okay? But when we look at it in the way God created, it becomes a very beautiful and a uh, enjoyable uh, aspect of marriage. Okay? All right. Uh, so as we go, go on, we also would like to share that um, sometimes people may fall into sexual sin before marriage, right? Different kinds of sexual sin. But that's when it's important to repent, to receive the forgiveness God has for us, and to be delivered and to commit to walk in purity, especially in that aspect of life. And it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to do so and keeps us from moving into a place of temptation. So it is needed that if there is any person who has gone through some form of sexual sin, to repent, to come clean, and um, uh, come to a place of living in purity uh, uh, till they walk into marriage. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's look at why God designed sex. What is the reason that God designed sex? He designed sex for procreation and enjoyment. Can someone read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 to 6? Now, getting down to the questions you asked in your letter to me. First, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of maturity. Mutuality. mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. Abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time. If you both agree it, and if it's for the purposes of prayer and fasting, but only for such times, then come back together again. Satan has an in, in, ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. I am not understand commanding these periods of abstinence, only providing my best counsel if you should choose them. Okay, so through the scripture, we see that what Paul is attempting to say. Okay, in verse um, 2, uh, he brings about, he says, marriage should provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life. So whatever you see around the world, the kind of sexual um, perversions that take place or distortions that take place, it's in marriage that you maintain that balanced and fulfilling sexual life. Okay. Verse 3 says it should be a place of mutuality. What does that mean? Where both agree to satisfy each other. Both the husband satisfying the wife and the wife satisfying the husband and not just looking for their personal pleasure, but being willing to support and help each other to enjoy it as they do. Verse 4, it says, um, it is an opportunity to enjoy each other's body, okay, and not and should not be used as a, um, like, like as a weapon to to hold off um, a, a sexual experience all right then verse 5 says you keep away from it only for a period of time only for the purpose or period of time for prayer and fasting all right and the last one which is very important verse 5 it says that satan uses this area for attack and so we should be on guard and to have a fulfilling sexual life is a part and parcel of the uh, of what the husband and the wife must enjoy all right 
So if you if you look into the next verse in Proverbs, that is Proverbs chapter 5, verses 15 to 19, it gives a very special instruction on what sexual intimacy should look like. What is that? If you read through, it says, the husband is the one, all the affection is focused only on his wife. The physical affection is focused only on his wife. You derive your fulfillment only from your wife. You delight in each other's, only in each other's body, and you delight in the love that comes from that. And it's the love that mutually they experience together. Okay? What else is sex for? It is an expression of commitment, intimacy, and pleasure. Can someone read 1 Corinthians 6, 16 to 20? 1 Corinthians 6, 16 to 20. There's more to sex that may marry skin or skin. Sex is as much a spiritual mystery as physical fact, as written in the scripture, that two become one. Since we want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely that, than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. There is a sense of in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. These bodies that were made for God-given and God-modeled love for becoming one with another. another. Or didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to a spiritual part of you. God owns the whole works. So let people see God in and through your body. Okay. So... It really talks about how uh, sex is just not a physical act, but it is a mystery. It's a spiritual mystery. And that spiritual mystery takes place when the uh, husband and the wife become one. Okay, So it's more than just a physical expression of love, but it is a spiritual mystery. Okay, It's also something that brings about commitment, intimacy. Right, the the commitment to to love and to enjoy each other is what sexuality also brings. Sex also is something that honors God. God is pleased when when this happens between when it is done in the way that He's designed it. That is when it is within marriage in the way that He has seen it. That pleases God and. It also is something that's given to man for his pleasure. So the so the un, the the knowledge is that God, you are God's. Not just your spirit and your soul. God's just not interested in your spiritual well-being. He's also interested in your physical well-being. So he's also interested in your body and how you use your body, because the Holy Spirit is during that sexual union between the husband and the wife, the Holy Spirit is sanctifying and blessing and making that physical act very sacred. And that's why from that comes that commitment and pleasure and um, and uh, intimacy. Okay? All right? So what? how did God design sex? God designed sex for procreation and enjoyment. And God designed sex for commitment, intimacy, and pleasure. Okay? There are some instructions that or practices that one can practice during sexual intimacy. And you could probably read through that. Some things for personal hygiene and health. It's important to take care of your personal well, personal hygiene when you're having, um, you know, in your sexual union. Okay, because it's something that you're doing for the other person, not just for yourself. So to be able to manage your personal health and your hygiene is very important. Okay. Also to manage your personal sexuality, to be able to direct your sex, your uh, sexual affections only towards your spouse and to refuse any other kind of defiling thought or uh, reasoning or fantasies or 
any other kind of addictions, whether it be pornography or um, you know sexual illicit message messaging, all of that, to ensure that you consecrate your sexual desires and your sexual affections towards towards your spouse only. All right. Uh, other co other things when we look at sexuality is also um, in marriage to decide um, when you will have children. Okay. So, yes, it is true that God desires to see uh, godly offspring from a godly husband and wife. So, when you prepare for marriage, it's a good thing to think about how many children you will have, um, you know, when will you have those children, what are the measures that you are going to take to avoid having um, an unplanned pregnancy, um, what would you do to avoid pregnancy after you have had the number of children that you desired. So all of this is something that you need to, you can get into conversation with your spouse and it's important to do so. There may be certain challenges that come, which may be infertility or miscarriages, where uh, couples may have, uh, probably are not able to conceive or have lost uh, fetuses. And that's when you come to believing God and committing your ways to him and seeking him for uh, for an answer uh, it may be it it is uh, it is unwise to end a marriage because you don't have children or you know your one of the spouses are infertile or impotent um, you you do not use that as a reason to stop the marriage or to end the marriage okay also to understand that abortion you know what abortion is, right? Yeah. Everyone knows what abortion is. Abortion is killing the baby in the womb of the of the, a live baby in the womb of the mother. Um, uh, it is remember that God sees it as sin. Uh, it is not acceptable to God, and uh, and it, it's probably only at a medical emergency that one decides to do so. Okay, all right. Yes, and. Uh, sexuality can be enjoyed throughout your season of life. And it's not just in the prime time of when you're 20 or 30, but 40s, 50s, and even beyond. Uh, it, it's all about building conversations and building intimacy in all ways, not just sexually, but even non-sexually to build that intimacy and to keep that enjoyment going on uh, you know, even as you age. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm done. Now I'm open for any questions that you may have uh, on both the, both the topics on managing your home as well as sexuality, sex and sexuality. Any questions? Sister, I have a question. Yes. Sister, this abortion is legalized in the Christian countries. Um, how, how this can be stopped, sister? So we are called to be the salt and the light. And um, yeah, there may be many things that we, each of us may need to speak up for. You know, in uh, in in different situations, conditions, and if you look in the U.S., there are two camps, right? One yeah. who be, one who are pro-life, and one who do, um, uh, you know, uh, do do go ahead with abortions. So we are called to really stand up for what is truth, even if we may be called as intolerant. It is to stand up for truth. That's the world that we live in. And that's what we are called to do, to stand up for the truth in love. And uh, to, by interceding in prayer, right, sister? You Absolutely. Can Absolutely, yes, to, to keep interceding. Because remember, this is all the work of the enemy. Yeah. To, uh, to bring down the plan of God, to bring down purposes of God, to bring down life. 
that's the plan of the enemy and uh, we read that you know the the work of the enemy or uh, we have our snakes and scorpions you know are under uh, our authority so we we continue to pray to continue to seek as well as do what we need to maybe in our places of influence to um to come against things that that displease god but of course doing it in love not by antagonizing uh, people but to doing it in love and through the anointing of the spirit okay, any other question Okay, if you don't have any questions, um, just a reminder of the assessment. I have put up the assessment. You have time. Uh, the online students, online students and in-person students have time till the 20th of October, whereas the e-learning students have it till the end of the course. So please ensure that you do it and because this counts towards your marking. All right? Uh, if there are no questions, we can close today. Would one of the students like to pray? One of my in-person students. Sir, assessment is not accessible. It's not accessible? It's not, is it? Okay. I'll look through it and make, make it. It's just a change in a setting. I will do that right after class, and you'll be able to check that. Okay? okay. Thank you. Right. So who's going to pray today? Lord Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time spent in your learning about marriage, my Lord, marriage class, my Lord. As we learn some new things in this class, my Lord, Lord, as we are stepping to that, Lord. You help us give the wisdom of knowledge to walk in your guidance, my Lord. Lord, as we are going through this entire course, my Lord, Lord, give your wisdom of knowledge for each one of us, my Lord. In Jesus' name, I may pray and ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Meet you all next week.